Hello, I'm Scott Soshnick. And I'm Evan Novi Williams, and this is the From the Scoring Tramp Sports Business Podcast, the Sportacast. All right, Mike Tolan, if you're listening to the show, we always grade Novi Williams sort of how he does that little tagline there when we're coming in. So I'm assuming you just went for a piece of slam ball equipment or terminology. I I don't think the energy was your usual self because we were waiting for so long. It's like you're an athlete who went in the game but didn't warm up. Mike, your thoughts on what was the term you said, Evan? What was it? From the scoring tramp. That's From the the scoring tramp. Mike Tolan, how was the intro from Evan Novi Williams? Uh, I love the intent. I love the spirit. Not quite all over the accuracy. They're all scoring tramps, man. They're all scoring tramps. They're all scoring tramps. score from all of them, but... Oh, that's a kick to the groin. If you tell a a journalist everything except the accuracy, what a kick to the groin, Eben. I'm a big jargon guy, and I love the term scoring tramp because in in other settings, obviously, it it would be offensive to use it to somebody else. But 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 in slam ball, it means something very different. Just to retract a little bit and get this thing off to a good start. It's not inaccurate. It's just a little misleading. How about that? Gotcha. Okay. I'll take that. I I don't approve of misleading (laughs) or inaccurate, so I'm sorry. He did a terrible job. You're getting a C- minus today, Novi Wims. But for those who don't know what the heck we're talking about this is slam ball you, you knew it back then and it's coming back my you know mike tolan you're part of uh, bringing slam ball back i gotta tell you lev akabas our data guy came to vegas participated tried it out yep. and, and said guys this is harder than you think no what, kidding. what what don't people know about slam ball that you would say you know what you, you, you really ought to know this i'll tell you who really learned it the hard way is beast mode i don't know if you guys know if you were listening one of our Rashawn. many color commentators was the one and only Marshawn Lynch and he <laughs> he loved it man but he we actually caught him on film getting on the tramp for the first time so there's four tramps it's a rectangular configuration four tramps embedded into a springy basketball court uh, on each uh, in front of each goal basically approximating an enlarged key area right and so there is there is a top tramp there's a down tramp there's two tramps on the wings and he sort of was bouncing from tramp to tramp to tramp, and he fell almost through the spring bed, almost almost through the court, which would have been a disaster. I don't want to comment on whether he had been drinking any adult beverages by that point or not, <laughs> but um, and he loved it. Like like Beast Mode is all over us now. He wants to buy a franchise. He wants the regional rights for the Bay Area. It's hard, man. I mean, I I was able to dunk all five eight of me, which is very empowering for a little guy who never even dreamed of dunking. But you really have to get you have to get your balance. You have to get, you know, a comfortable with being being 10 feet above the floor. And it is it is, it is a process. And the athletes that we get to do it, man, it is like people go, well, what makes a great slam ball athlete? Because we call it the, the intersection between basketball and football. There's a great deal of hitting in the open court. I mean, it's like it's like football blocking, hockey checking type hitting. And there's also this incredible elevation, right? So you're you're sometimes higher than the top top of the backboard. So there's a, a, a the three Fs, I would say, fearlessness, um, for, ferocity, and what's the last one? Fe- just being fearsome. I mean, it's like, think of Russell Westbrook, the way he plays basketball. That's how every slam ball player has to compete. I, I was thinking when you were just when you were describing sort of the, the altitude and all that, and there was another F. I just heard, I just heard my mother like just, just pounding around my head saying, "You're foolish." <laughs> that was okay. the one that I went was around say my flying. head. Flying, <laughs> yeah, yeah fl- you're 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 effing flying foolish. That's what I could see coming through my head. Mike, I think a lot of our listeners probably know that slam ball uh, was a very popular thing 20 years ago, and, and, and you guys just brought it back. What was it about right now? Is it something you've been trying to do for a while? What made 2023 the time that for slam ball's great return? It's a great question. Um, we had a nice run at the basically the turn of the century. Um, it really was 20-plus <laughs> years ago. And, yeah. then we, and then we had slam ball China. I mean, China is a country of – a billion people who are largely diminutive and love basketball. And so for them to be Duncan, it was kind of great, except the epicenter of slam ball in China was Wuhan, which was also, I think, the epicenter of something else. So that shut down for a couple of years. <laughs> but during the shutdown, an amazing thing happened, which was social media just grabbed slam ball and ran with it. So hashtag bring back slam ball develops without any of our support. I mean, this was just an organic grassroots development and all of a sudden we have a half a billion views and mason gordon who is the rocket science who invented the thing who came to me with a napkin 20 years ago and said hey man take a look at this primitive little drawing like what if we embedded trampolines in a basketball court and what if you know we incorporated football style hitting and guys were flying 
this way and that. Um, so with the advent of the social media claim and with, as you guys know, um, the fact that live sports are king right now and really who's watching television at the time something's happening except for sports, right? It is the only remaining water cooler culture, we thought. So we just started dipping our toes and started talking to people we know in the community. You, you know these guys, like the big sports industrialists. Um, and we found some very eager participants, you know, guys like Michael Rubin and David Blitzer and Gary Vaynerchuk and Roger Ehrenberg, who's our lead investor, and Blake Griffin, who, you know, we all remember the Kia, right? So, like, we, we, our joke is we're going to have to get a Mack truck for him to jump over to Duncan Slam Ball off a trampoline. I, um, I'm so old. I was there when he went over the Kia. Me too. I was in attendance that day. Yeah, yeah. it was great in, in L.A. Uh, it was yep. awesome. Um, well, you dropped a hint that Marshawn Lynch wants, uh, Lynch wants to buy a franchise. What's that set me back? Uh, it's not happening yet. He's a little ahead of the game. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about establishing an investment level where you get regional rights, and we're thinking 2025 would probably be the likely timeline. Um, so we made a two-year deal with ESPN, um, and we had 40-some hours of programming this summer. The, the key was, um, if we're going to do this, it's not going to be an attraction. It's not going to be a package TV show. It's going to be a live, legitimate sport. So all the games are broadcast live, which means, of course, you can bet on them. So we're set in Vegas, and we have Circa, which is the largest sports book in Vegas. And they're setting lines, man, and they're moving like crazy. Like, we got to the finals. Uh, we happened to have this crazy thing happen just to show that we were live and real and not fixing the matches in any kind of way. There was a team called the Mob that was a juggernaut and went 18 and 18 and 0. Um, and so the line opened at minus five and a half because one of their players was injured and the other team had a guy coming back from an injury. And the smart money moved the line from minus five and a half to minus seven and a half in the hour before the game. And they crushed. They covered the spread easily. Um, but, it, you know, Circa is is all over it. And we hope by next summer, it was a two year deal with ESPN. And by next summer, uh, hopefully betting will be available in most of the states in the country. And the games are short. So. In a two-hour program, whether you're watching at home or in attendance, there's three games in the two hours. So if it doesn't go so well in the first game, you you got a shot to get it back. Can we dive into some of the numbers to the extent that you can, Mike? How much money did you raise? What did it cost to put in? What what, what does the runway look like right now? I'm curious from a business standpoint. Kind of yeah, what we were to get this going. We weren't overreaching. We just said, we, we, you know, we, we uh, penciled out the numbers and we said, what do we need to get ourselves through two years of tournaments to really give this thing a foothold? Um, we went out looking for 10 and we got 11. So we oversubscribed by, by a million bucks. Um, I mentioned some of the key names. I didn't mention everybody. There's a great guy named Kevin Nagel, who's a part owner of Sacramento Kings and uh, has some overseas hockey interests and all. And um, we are uh, delighted with their enthusiasm and support. And uh, we're just now talking about, do we want to put a tournament up in the spring so that there's not a full year between the big events in the summer? We kind of look at SummerSlam as like the big event, but in a, in a way that the way tennis and golf have their grand slams, we're thinking this may evolve into quarterly events and we'll probably be doing them both domestically and internationally because we have Australia and India and Turkey and lots of countries who want slam ball in their home country. So it's exciting. I can't wait till Mukesh Ambani has a team, you know, in, in one of the regions. I got to tell you, Mike, though, let me tell you something about Evan, because I'm fascinated. You're telling me there are sharps who are moving the line on slam ball and making money. Like Novi Williams was one of the early ones walking or biking halfway across the George Washington Bridge to geolocate to New Jersey so he could place bets. I mean, I'm fascinated. What, what kind of what, what's total handle? Can, can you have any idea what's total handle well, on, on I, slam ball? That's a great question. It was limited just to a few states. Um, I really don't know. Um, I'd love to find out. We will find out by next summer. And, uh, and there'll be a lot more. Uh, right now, we pretty much have um, the lines, money bets, and over-unders. But I hope we can extend that to props and individual scoring totals and so forth. We've been talking a lot on this show recently about the, the blending of entertainment and sports. And Scott and I had a long conversation about Deion Sanders, which I actually want to get your thoughts on maybe later in this in okay. this conversation. Um, but Slam Ball, from, from my eyes, seems to fit very perfectly into the way these things are blending right now. It is, it is tremendous entertainment. There's also competition. I'm curious how you think about those two things. I see some WWE in what you guys are doing. I see some NBA in what you guys are doing. And trying to thread the needle in the middle seems 
to be the. It's a great, it's a great question, and ultimately, um, you try to control the narrative, and then the narrative takes on a life of its own, and then you just try to corral it, right? Okay, so like <laughs> when we were doing the Last Dance, um, it was you know was it a story of the Chicago Bulls dynasty of the '90s or was it the Michael Jordan story? And of course, it was both, and we just put it out there, and we let most people refer to it as the Jordan doc, right? Okay, so. Um, with Slam Ball, you know, it, it was a little bit too much of a sideshow and it was a little too much entertainment first, I think, when it was on mm. Spike TV. And so the big effort, as I said, in bringing it back was making sure it was live, making sure it was bettable, making sure it was legit. Um, and so I think at this point, the balance is starting to get to the right place where um, better and better athletes are coming aboard. I mean, I think next year we're going to have D1. Look, the NBA draft only goes 60 deep, right? There are... How many thousands of kids who grow up dreaming of playing in the league and there's only 60 of them who are going to get their ticket. We're going to start getting that level of quality players who are going to say, I'm going to go play slam ball and, you know, and play for 15 years. It's, it's exhilarating. So, um, you know, where I think we're you know, getting a foothold is it's, it's kind of like in the short attention span theater that we all live. Our seven seconds is probably better than yours if you happen to be watching pickleball or cornhole or I don't want to denigrate any other sports, but it is it is really fun to watch and it appeals to a younger demo, which is, you know, the ultimate goal for most of these platforms is to get younger viewers and, you know, get them in for the long haul. Evan, I think you just denigrated pickleball and cornhole. <laughs> <laughs> love so, Mike, tell me. Guess what? Give me a give me a six pack. More exciting seven party. seconds. I believe that. And yeah. I love, yeah, I love playing cornhole before an Eagles game on a Sunday afternoon. But and I love playing tennis. But whatever, I'll stop there. I, I was gonna, uh, I'm, I was okay. going to ask you, Mike, about about star power because there there are uh, some smaller leagues yes. that that are and pickleball yes. is courting ATP players. They're trying to get star power there. There are small football leagues that get college names of people that you know. Um, how important is that to you? It's a great question. A, a it's a great that question. Has names that baby basketball fans recognize. The really cool thing about this is, as a guy who makes films, and you come together. Um, we're a small independent company. We put together an army to make a TV show or a movie. Um, we do it. It goes out into the world. People make their judgment and everybody goes off. It's kind of like a, a circus troupe and it moves to the next town. Um, with Slam Ball, we're, we're creating a life for a, a nucleus of people who have now come aboard front office and players who want to play this thing forever. So, you know, as, as we saw this evolve in Vegas and the crowds were coming and it was really exciting and, and people were discovering it on ESPN, it was like, wow, this is, you know, a whole new niche that we have to really be smart and really make smart decisions for the long haul, right? So um, obviously profile is key. We, f we sort of feel in the short term that we, we don't want to compromise the integrity of the play by just bringing in a – look, it works for big three – because they're playing the same sport, right? So, you know, maybe yeah. they're a little older, um, but it works. You know, like I, we just made a doc on uh, Mahmoud Abdul Rauf, and like he can still make the long bomb, right? Um, and slam ball, like I don't know if Russell Westbrook would be a great slam ball player. I kind of think so, but maybe not. So we're looking at these guys as potential owners. You know, to have Shaquille on a team is going to obviously get a lot of attention, right? There are a lot of guys, you know, from basketball, football, and other sports, and even from the entertainment world. Um, who are talking to us, and we kind of love the idea. So I think by the year after next, you'll see big names, at least as part of ownership and helping spread the gospel. Forgive me for not knowing the rules, but can you put Shaq on the trampoline right below the basket, and he can just jump up and, like, totally it deck would, people who are trying to get to the rim? It would be tough. It would be tough. The The guy under the basket is called a stopper. And That would be Shaq. He's a stopper. Shaq. Yes, I would, if he qualifies. <laughs> and it is cool because instead of a foul shot, we have a face-off, right? So what is the most boring part of a basketball game most becomes the most exciting part of a slam ball game. They blow the whistle. The defensive guy gets on the baseline in the corner. The offensive guy gets it half court. And they each run toward the basket and jump off opposing uh, tramps and meet each other 15 feet above the floor. And full contact is allowed. Almost anything you can do to stop that ball from going in the hoop. So that's entertainment. Speaking of com things coming to a stop quickly, I want to get your take, Mike, on sort of just the strikes that are going on in Hollywood as it pertains to Disney and Charter. Uh, a major league commissioner asked me the other day, who do you think won? What do you think was the, you know, the takeaway from the Disney Charter settlement? And we both agreed that the winner was sports yeah. in general. Like all the channels that were dropped, 
had nothing to do with sports. Everybody's going to include sports. And do I think that a sports fan will pay 30, 40 bucks a month for a bundle of sports? The answer is yes. I mean, ESPN is looking at a standalone. We'll see what the pricing is. I know there's a lot that goes into the universe, but also the, the sports is being pushed amid these strikes. You see what uh, Monday Night Football on ABC. Your thoughts on so just sort of where we are in the entertainment world with these strikes, where it's headed, and how sports fit into the whole component? Well, the strikes suck, okay? <laughs> Nobody's happy. Uh, uh, we are kind of Switzerland. Um, we are content creators, so though, so our sympathies are with the writers, and we have two writers on our staff, and I have a ton of friends who are writers, and it, it's it, it's been said it's an existential crisis. That's a big word. What does it really mean? Well, it really means that it's not just a a, a squabble over who's getting what percentage of the pie. It's about reshaping the dynamic, and it just feels to me like. Um, writers are a little bit endangered. I mean, AI is part of it, but it's really about wanting less writers for less periods of time and, and giving them less money. So um, it's scary. You know, if I had a kid who was 22 coming out of college, I would really, you'd really, really have to not just want to be a writer, but need to be a writer to go in that direction right now. It's really challenging. And I think it's, it's the universe is shrinking. So, so that's scary. On the sports front, however, you know, it's just, it's just ballooning. And as you said, um, whatever you think about the charter Disney deal, ESPN plus is in it. It, 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 it solidified its place. It's going to elevate its, its positioning. And, and it's, it, I think viewership's going to grow. It's a big part of slam ball because we had 20 plus events. Um, less than half of them were, di were linear. We had a couple on the mothership. We had a couple of deuces and then we had a lot of digital. Their thing was, look, if ESPN is going to be, um, the carrier for slam ball. We want it all. We are the mothership. We are the worldwide leader. And so they took it all. So they, you know, so they made this deal for 40 plus hours, which was great. And people are finding the games on ESPN plus now, you know, a month after the events were over. Um, I think um, the other win is that it sort of clears the path. And ultimately we know the Disney, uh, excuse me, ESPN is going to be a consumer facing app and, it's just a matter of, of when and who it's going to be with. It's it's not a question of if anymore. And like you said, how much do we pay for, you know, our, our what we've been used to paying, our regional rights for a local baseball team? You know, I have the MLB app. I have Sunday Ticket. I'm paying way more than $30 a, a month to get my sports fix. So by all means, if you can put an efficient bundle together uh, and get me what I need, I think I think it's going to work. One of the things I've been thinking about, particularly around the strike, is that there's a big part of this strike that is uh, reacting to the way that streamer, big streaming companies like Netflix and Amazon have affected the economics in TV and, and movie making. And sports teams are getting to the point where they're starting to rely on some of those same companies to, to bid up for, for sports rights. And I do wonder if the, the, the frustration that some people in the, in the, in the TV and, and television economy have with those companies and the way that they do business might, might also happen in sports in 10 years as sports shifts its reliance from some of the TV to, the, to, to those streaming companies. I'm curious your thoughts. Well, um, I think the concern right now for a consumer is the confusion and the lack of clarity of who's broadcasting what and when. Um, but what's great from a, a content creator and from a fan's perspective is that everybody wants to join the party, right? So Apple's got big deals with MLS and MLB. Um, Peacock is doing a ton of sports broadcasting, sometimes standalone, but oftentimes with uh, NBC. Like, you know, they're going to have right next year when the Pac-12 explodes and Big Ten has its little three windows, they arguably have the best window, right? The NBC Peacock window is gonna be very dynamic. Um, Amazon has obviously made a gigantic splash. We saw the streaming numbers for the for the Monday night. Um, I think the Eagles game, uh, being the Philly guy that I am, I'm I was gonna proud. say you had to bring it back to Philly. I knew Always, we'd get man. there. Always, man. The Eagles Vikings game set a record for sports streaming. Um, Marie Donahue and Charlie Newman and, and, the, and the guys making docs at Amazon, Matt Newman and, and Noah and those guys are really aggressive. And, and, and what I love to see is once you start getting rights and you're cultivating an audience, then they start doing docs and other kinds of uh, unscripted programming, which is kind of where we live. That's our bread and butter. So, you know, the idea of uh, there's a slam ball documentary that's being made. We were shooting everything and we have 20 years of history. So hopefully that will be a part of the 2024 
uh, broadcast as a slam ball documentary. I think it's a golden age. I think it's, you know, there have been some formats that have been replicated. Obviously, the, the F1 Drive to Survive series has been extremely successful and has now been done in golf and in tennis and in surfing and in Tour de France. And Is there a risk of oversaturation with the copycats? Nah. Nah, nah. I, I don't. I don't. I mean, you know, it just means you have to be uh, you have to be more selective as a consumer. Um, that's that's the problem is like cutting through the clutter and knowing what to watch. For instance, Philly guy that I am, the Jason Kelsey documentary. I was about to bring this exact thing up, the Kelsey doc. Yeah, it's amazing. It's great. I mean, I have to say it's a uh, it's a very high bar for me because I was kind of involved. Some of the guys that made it in Philly are my friends and. Uh, I know those people, and I was really great to see the admirable restraint. Uh, you know, they got the dream scenario. The pixie dust came down on them, and all of a sudden, the Super Bowl features Jason and his brother, and it's the Kelsey Bowl, right? But they just sort of let it unfold while the, while Jason's wife is giving birth, and you just can't invent this. Um, so, and so Amazon smartly promotes it the week of their of their first game and Jason comes on afterwards and they go right to it and I'm sure the numbers were huge and that's the kind of uh, synergy between the, the live rights and the unscripted that really works. We never got to Dion. <laughs> but, but let me get your thoughts. I yes, mean, quickly. Evan and I had this so, big... Well, yeah, quickly. I know you have to get to a lunch. Well, so, um, um, you're not in Rittenhouse Square today, by the way. I was, uh, the Rouge Burger in Rittenhouse Square, one of the best burgers I've ever had. No, so, nice. just, just to bring have a little, a little bit of Philly. But I think Evan and I disagree a little bit. I, I think this is awesome, this Dion thing, I, I, this, this melding. He is the epitome of where we are of entertainment and sport marriage. It is a reality show as much as it is sport. Evan, I think, is a little bit of a naysayer. He thinks it's going to peter out. Well, he's, he's got Oregon and USC, so let's see if he's three and two. He had a big injury with Hunter. Um, look, it's it's great because all of a sudden a Colorado Colorado State game is is everybody wants to watch it. Primetime Saturday night, it gets record ratings. Um, uh, he, you know, nobody says a bad word about Dion, right? I mean, you know, Buck Showalter is talking about his work ethic when he when he played baseball, um, and and to to do what he did in two sports. Um, he's the real deal, okay? And he was serious, and to go out and get, what, 69 players out of the transfer portal, and um, his, his son is not just playing quarterback because he's his son, right? This is a legit All-American candidate. We have a project with USC um, with a pretty fair quarterback. You might have heard of named Caleb Williams. And so they have Oregon and then USC. Um, let's, see, let's see where the dust settles. But I don't know if we're predicated on his winning or losing. I'd, like, if, they, if it goes, if it tanks... I'm, I'd want to see that too. Sure. <laughs> what happens in the universe when he walks in the locker room and they just got it's pounded by tank. forty points? It's not going to tank. It's just a question of like, are they contenders for a conference title? Are they contenders for the playoffs? Or are they just going to, you know, win seven or eight games and get in a bowl? I mean, they're on they're on the map for sure to stay. When you're making, how much do you think about keeping the thread of 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 what's happening on the field or on the court versus the entertainment sideshow layered on top of that. Is that a hard balance sometimes? Cause it I, is a, it I wonder is a, with Dion how much, if we're focusing on too much of the, of the latter and not the former. Well, he's, he's, he's going out there and getting it done. Right. I mean, I don't think the, the so sunglasses far. and the cowboy hat was a distraction. Um, right. They all got, they all got their own sunglasses. It was, it was great for the sunglass maker. Right. It was a tremendous promotion. Didn't seem to get in the way of playing the game. So, you know, if you're a fan, I mean, I, I it's a great question. Again, like the sideshow cannot take center stage and cannot get in the way of playing the game. I mean, we take our sports too seriously. And, and but he's he's done it at such a high level as an athlete and his his passion for it. Um, I'm friendly with his his partners uh, in production. Constant Schwartz is amazing. Constant Schwartz Marini. Yeah. yeah. What 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 they've done is and they've been very careful. And every step they've made so far has been the right one. So. Um, good for them, man. I'm all in. I think it's great for great for fans and great for the sporting landscape. Can't wait for him to own a slam ball franchise. Looking forward to it. Any day now. Thanks, I go guys. Get Thanks so much. We appreciate it.